Well, hi, everybody. Um, I'm Daniel James Brown. Actually, in my day-to-day -day life, I'm just plain old Dan Brown. But um, I learned early in my writing career uh, that if you Google Dan Brown, you're going to get a million hits on the Da Vinci Code and no hits on me. So I went with the long, ponderous thing that I have as a um, nom de plume. At any rate, um, thank you for coming out. Um, I want to talk to you today about a group of young Americans who went to um, the Berlin Olympics in 1936. Um, but I always like to start by acknowledging that I think most people, when they think about the 36 Olympics in Berlin, the first thing that occurs uh, uh, to them is usually, and rightly, the Jesse Owens story. The Jesse Owens story is one that we keep alive in our culture. We put in textbooks. We tell our kids and our grandkids. Because it's one of those stories that helps remind us of who we are, or at least who we are at our best, the things we value or purport to value uh, as the core of our Americanness, um, racial tolerance, um, a level playing field, fairness, um, and great individual achievements. Um, the story of these uh, young men uh, I'm going to talk about uh, this afternoon who went to Berlin, um, I think it is another story that deserves to um, be kept alive in our culture uh, because it also helps remind us of who we are uh, when we're at our best. But it approaches it from a very different angle. It's a, it's a story not about great uh, individual achievement, but a story about great team achievement. And I think it reminds us that, at least historically, we've been a people who've been pretty good at building great teams and getting things done and working together. And I'm not sure that that's as true these days as it has been historically. And I'll, I'll come back to that uh, in some, at some length here in a bit. Um, but first, let me. Um, First, let me tell you how I came to write this book, because that has a lot to do with what the book turned out to be. About eight years ago, I, um, my neighbor came to me. I live in rural Washington state. It's more or less out in the woods, but we do have some neighbors. And my neighbor, a lady I knew only as Judy, came to me. And she said she'd been reading one of my earlier books to her father, um, her, who was 90 years old, uh, and that he was enjoying that, and he wanted to meet me. And so I went down, I think it was the next day, and I met this elderly gentleman named Joe Rance. And Joe was, um, he was uh, actually in the last couple months of his life living under hospice care at Judy's house. And he was weak, and he was on oxygen, and he was stretched out on a recliner. Um, but he was very alert mentally. And so I sat down, we talked a little bit about that earlier book, but then uh, his daughter Judy began to, to prod him and to question him. Uh, pretty systematically into telling the story of his own life. And if you've read the book, you know he had a very, very difficult childhood during the Great Depression. And that, that story in itself really began to affect me as I listened to it. Uh, but then he went on and he began to talk about how he came to row uh, at the University of Washington starting in the fall of 1933, and how that had begun to, um, to change his life and to redeem it in certain ways. And then, how he and his, two, his teammate had um, gone on to row uh, at the 1936 Olympics for a gold medal, rowing against uh, Germany in front of Adolf Hitler. And as I listened to this story, I just became more and more mesmerized by it. And I also, I noticed that he was, as he was telling it, he was tearing up from time to time. And that he was tearing up in particular whenever he talked about any of the other guys that were in that boat with him back in 1936. And I wasn't sure what the tears were about. I thought at first that they were um, uh, for the loss of his uh, teammates, most of whom had passed away in the preceding few years. But I could see there was a lot of joy and pride in those tears uh, at the same time. And by the end of the conversation, I, I was just absolutely floored by, the, um, by what he was saying. And I decided right then and there I wanted to write a book about it. So I asked Joe, and I, I put it in exactly the wrong way for Joe. Um, I said, Joe, can I write a book about your life? And, and he shook his head, and he said, no. And he looked down, and my heart kind of sank. But then he looked up, and um, 
he had those tears in his eyes again, and, and he sort of croaked out. He said, um, but you could write a book about the boat. And I didn't know what he meant at first. I thought he meant the Husky Quipper, this beautiful cedar rowing shell that they had rowed in Berlin. But then, of course, I realized that what he meant by the boat was all those guys that had rowed with him and what they had done back in 1936. But really something more even than that, what they had all become together that summer in 1936, this almost perfect living, breathing thing that a great crew is. And that really energized me. So I started the next day um, working on what turned out to be about a four year long project of researching um, the story and, and putting it down uh, in the form of a book. And that, that eventually turned into uh, The Boys in the Boat. Now since the book has come out, um, I get emails um, almost every day from readers and there's certain comments that come up uh, in those emails, and you'll see this also in Amazon reviews. Um, and one of the things that comes up over and over again is I get, um, I get an email or a message that says, well, I almost didn't read your book because um, I thought it was about rowing and really what could be more boring than a book about rowing. And, and you know, I have to say, I would have said the same thing eight years ago when I started this. I didn't have any particular interest in rowing. Um, fortunately, people then generally go on to say, um, but wow, you know, the book turned out to be about so much more than rowing. And that's what I discovered also during those years that I was researching the story and, and writing it. It turned out to be a big, epic, sweeping story about the human heart. It was a story about this one boy, Joe, who first learned that he couldn't trust anybody in the world, not even his own family but then learned that to do what he really wanted to do in life, he had to turn around and learn to trust other people on a very deep, fundamental level. It was a story about an almost mystical figure, this British-born boat builder named George Pocock and how he influenced the lives of these nine young men. It was a story about a somewhat hard man, uh, a coach named Al Ulbrichsen, who had become literally obsessed with an Olympic dream. It was a story uh, about love, um, it was a love story. It was a story about grit and determination in the face of overwhelming odds. It was a story about psychological devastation, but also ultimate jubilation. It was a story about the American genius for defying long odds. It was about the cold realities of li life in America during the Dust Bowl and the Great Depression. It was about uh, Joseph Goebbels and Adolf Hitler and Leni Riefenstahl. It was about propaganda and deceit uh, and democratic values come face to face with Nazi cynicism. And, um, and it was a story, most of all, of these nine good-hearted young Americans who came together and learned to become something much larger than the sum of their parts. And in that way, um, it became a story, for me at least, of um, their generation and the extent to which they personified and represented their generation. And I will, I will come back to that also in a bit. Now that's not to say that rowing isn't central to the uh, story. As I say, I, I didn't have any particular interest in rowing when I started this, and I've become, I've become quite a passionate fan at this point. And I just want to tick through a few of the things I like about the sport itself before I go on to larger things. Um, first of all, there's very few things that humans do, um, uh, either in sports or in any other endeavor, that match rowing for the um, extraordinary uh, rapid output of energy uh, and the, the demands that it puts on the body as rowing, particularly rowing at the level I'm talking about here, at the Olympic level. Um, it's, it's an extraordinarily demanding and painful sport, and it's hard not to admire um, the sheer grit and guts of people that do it and do it well. Um, there's also very few things that match rowing uh, in the world of sports or, or in many other fields um, for the degree of exquisite skill and precision and synchronization that is involved in the sport. Uh, 
a rowing coach once said that if you put eight uh, men or women in a, in a racing shell and ask them to row a 2,000 meter race, that's like handing them each a, a golf club and putting golf balls in front of them and asking them to all swing and hit those balls at precisely the same moment um, and to do that over and over every two or three seconds for the next six minutes. It's an enormous amount of precision and skill involved in getting the oars, simply getting the oars in and out of the water correctly. There's the incredible mental toughness of uh, it. Uh, rowers uh, generally rise very, in the mor very early in the morning. Uh, they row in all kinds, particularly where I come from up in the Seattle area, out on Lake Washington. They row all winter out, uh, out there. They row in ice and hail and snow with ice in their oar locks. And it's, um, it's, um, it's, it's extraordinarily demanding uh, on that level also. And then there's a long, colorful history uh, and tradition associated with the sport. I don't remember if it was Yale that, char that uh, challenged Harvard or the other way around. But in 1852, those two schools met for a boat race. And um, that was either the first or very nearly the first intercollegiate uh, contest of any kind in this country. And a long tradition has come down uh, with the sport since that, since that first race. Um, and then finally, um, there's a lot more drama in rowing than may be obvious to you if you have ever casually watched a, a, a crew race on the Charles in Boston or, or anywhere else. It's not the world's best spectator sport. Um, so much of the drama that takes place takes place inside the boat. And one of the things I wanted to do with this book was put you as readers in the boat so you could participate in that drama. But um, from, the, from the rower's point of view, there's a great deal of drama going on in a boat race. Um, and then in the 1930s, um, a great deal of the drama for the sport came um, from the fact that crew was an enormously popular sport in the 1930s and 40s. It's hard to imagine these days, but 100,000 people or more um, would gather for major regattas. Um, both on the East Coast and on the West Coast. Prominent oarsmen uh, found their images on the front of the Saturday Evening Post and, and other major magazines. Uh, important races were carried live, uh, sometimes coast to coast on radio, and millions of people tuned in to listen to these uh, races, and millions of dollars were wagered on the outcomes of the races. A coxswain's sore throat could make national news. Um, and at the 1936 Olympics uh, in Berlin, actually the rowing venue out at uh, Grunau, outside of Berlin, that was actually the second largest spectator venue at the 36 games, second only to the enormous um, Colosseum that the Nazis built in central uh, Berlin itself. Um, so it was an enormously popular uh, sport. and. Um, the, the story uh, in the book culminates, of course, in this extraordinary gold medal race in Berlin. And I'm going to sh show you a clip from that race in just a moment. But before, I, before we do that, I just want to tell you what these guys were against. We're leaping way forward in the story now until they, they arrive in Germany and they've placed and they're, they're, they're ready to, to race in the gold medal race. Um, it was a windy, rainy, pretty miserable, blustery day on the longer sea, this body of water that they're going to be rowing on. Um, there was a stiff headwind, a sort of quartering headwind coming down the race course. Um, despite having turned in the fastest qualifying time of all the competing crews, uh, the American boat and the British boats were mysteriously assigned lanes five and six out in the windiest part of the race course. Germany and Italy, the two fascist states, were, had turned in very slow qualifying times, and they were assigned lanes one and two, which were largely protected the whole length of the race course. So that was, that was odd and never really explained. Um, the American stroke, uh, the stroke is the guy that sits right in front of the coxswain. He sets the rhythm for the whole boat. Everybody else in the boat is replicating his rhythm. So he's absolutely critical to the success of the boat. Don Hume, the American a stroke that day, he'd been sick on and off for weeks with some kind of respiratory um, uh, affliction. 
The day of the gold medal race, he could hardly get out of bed, and he would, in fact, nearly pass out partway through the race. He was very, he was a very sick kid. Um, as the event, the event got underway, um, uh, Adolf Hitler and Joseph Goebbels, Hermann Göring, and actually pretty much the whole top of the Nazi hierarchy entered the regatta grounds, dressed in dark capes. The crowd rose to their feet, gave the Nazi salute, began chanting, Sieg Heil, Sieg Heil. Hitler and his entourage went up on the uh, balcony of a boathouse uh, to, to watch the events, and things got underway. Germany uh, promptly won the first five gold medals in rowing that day. Um, and as the Germany won medal after medal after medal, the crowd got more and more excited. So by the time the, American, uh, the Americans were paddling out to the start line for the eight, the eight oared race, which is the big prestige event of the Olympics, uh, with eight, eight men and a coxswain in the boat, by this point, the crowd is chanting Deutschland, Deutschland, Deutschland. They get out to the starting line. They line up. They're in the windiest part of the course. Waves are breaking over the bow of the boat. And on top of everything else that's gone wrong, they don't hear when the start is called. It's called just with a voice command and the drop of a flag, but they are positioned so they can't see the flag. They don't know the race has started until they see the boat to one side of them, it would have been the British boat, leap forward. They dig with all they have. They row and they row, but halfway through the race course, a thousand meters down the, the way, they are uh, tied with the Brits for last place. Uh, Bobby Mock, the coxswain, the only guy in the American boat facing forward, is looking down the race course, the waves breaking over his bow, Germany and Italy are streaking down lanes one and two toward what seemed to be inevitable gold medal and um, silver medal finishes. But that's not the way it turns out. You're going to see how it turns out here. I should say just before we run this that um, you might get a glimpse of the American boat at the very beginning of the film. They'll be at the very top of your screen. You won't see them again until very near the end, when, uh, at which point they will have turned things around quite dramatically. So if we can run that. Die Entscheidung im Achter. Schweiz, Ungarn, England, Amerika, Italien und Deutschland. Zum ersten Mal bei den Olympischen Spielen hat sich ein deutscher Achter bis zur Entscheidung durchgekämpft. So the Americans at the very top and Germany and Italy are down in front here. These are the Italians at the bottom. Deutschland greift an. And Germany. Deutschland holt auf. Sieht gleich. Die Wikinger gehen in Führung. the Americans. They didn't wear their uniforms. Uh, the Swiss, the Germans, the Italians. That's Bobby Mock, the American coxswain, the Don Hume, the spirit board. There are the Americans up top. 
You can see what it takes out of these guys. That's Bob Mock. Uh, Shorty Hunt starting to feel better. Joe Rance. Uh, Jim McMillan. Uh, if you're wondering about that clip there, uh, that's from Lenny Riefenstahl's um, uh, big uh, documentary slash propaganda film that she made for the Nazis in 1936. And Lenny Riefenstahl's a whole fascinating story unto herself, and I'm not really going to get into that here. But um, in addition to whatever else she was, uh, she was actually a very good filmmaker and kind of ahead of her time in terms of filmmaking. And I think part of what's interesting about that clip is um, they did not, of course, have cameras in the boats the day of the Olympic uh, race. What she did is she got the American, the Italian, and the German boats to row again the next day. And she did put cameras in the, in the boats. And that's where all those close-ups came from. The pullback shots were all shot the day of the race. And then she intercuts the uh, close-ups with the pullback uh, shots in a very effective way because it gives you this sort of building sense of tension and for a frenetic um, tension as the, as the race unfolds. So, so I think it was pretty effective. Um, okay, so, um, so how did these guys do it? Um, you, it the, the quip's unfortunate in one way, which is that you never really see uh, how far behind they were at 1,000 meters. By the time you, you see what you just saw, they are very much back in contention for the lead. Um, but they came back from an extraordinary distance. And, and so the question is, how did they, how did they pull it off? And um, I think it comes down, um, I think it comes down to certain key qualities uh, that characterize them as individuals and as a team. Um, and also though, and this is what I want to get at today, uh, characteristics that uh, to some extent made them representatives of their generation. Because I think those two things are linked. I think the th qualities that allowed them to win, to come back, uh, are some of the qualities that um, help define their generation of Americans. And I'm just going to go through some of those qualities, and other people might come up with a different list, but having known some of these guys and having studied them and written about them, these are the things I think that were really remarkable about them. First of all, these guys uh, personified perseverance and resilience. The guys who made it into that boat you just saw, they went to Berlin with the end product of a long, brutal selection process. Hundreds and hundreds of young men were whittled down to uh, the nine in that boat. And it was largely a self-selecting process. The ones who made it were the ones who came back day after day, month after month, rowing out on Lake Washington in the sleet and the snow and the rain and the wind with ice in their oarlocks rowing past pain day after day and sticking with it. Um, also, it's important to understand who these guys were in terms of persistence and resilience. The, the young men who wound up in that boat, became Team USA, were um, working class kids from dairy farms and mill, fa mill towns around Washington. Uh, they had grown up in the woods as lumberjacks, as fishermen, digging ditches, dealing with dairy cattle, um, doing manual labor. To get into that boat and to get that gold medal that they got, they had to first come up against, row against their very good West Coast rivals, um, at my alma mater, Cal Berkeley, and Cal had a great rowing crew, um, which generally had been thought most likely to win the Olympics. Then they had to go up against and defeat um, the schools from the East, which in those days were the rowing powers were predom predominantly uh, Ivy League schools. Um, so they were rowing against the sons of um, 
bankers and attorneys and um, U.S. senators and even presidents. FDR had, uh, had a son rowing at the same time that these guys were rowing. They had, to, they had to get past that. Then they had to go up against and defeat kids from Oxford and Cambridge uh, in the UK. And then finally they had to go up against and defeat what was essentially a hand-picked Nazi crew in, in Germany. So they were classic American underdogs in that sense. Second, um, they were adaptable. They learned to adapt to a wide variety of situations. That race you just saw was a 2,000 meter sprint race. A race basically all out, hard as you can go, start to finish pretty much. But weeks before that, they had won a four mile race in Poughkeepsie, New York, a completely different kind of rowing experience. They had learned to um, employ different strategies, rowing from behind or rowing from the front. They'd rowed, learned to row on rough water and on flat water. They had learned to row on lakes with no currents at all and in rivers with strong currents. They had rowed in hot weather, that, uh, the Olympic qualifying uh, uh, races at Princeton. It was over 100 the day they qualified for the Olympics. They had rowed many times, as I say, with ice in their oarlocks up in Seattle. So they were extremely adaptable. The third thing, they developed an extraordinary level of mutual trust and respect for one another. And I can't emphasize this enough, but rowing as a sport is all about trust. From the moment you climb into one of these boats, they're only about 24 inches wide. So everything you do, affects everybody else in the boat. A flick of your wrist at the wrong time can cause your whole crew to lose a race. You row with your back to the finish line so you can't even see where you're going. You're trusting the coxswain at all times to be doing the right thing. And most of all, most fundamentally, you're trusting every other man or woman in that boat to be putting his or her full weight and strength into every pull of the oar, because if he or she isn't, then you're having to carry that, that weight instead. So it is a sport that is, is, I just can't emphasize enough how fundamentally it is about trusting one another. And I have to say, these guys trusted one another for the rest of their lives. It was really touching knowing the last few of them as old men, how very close they still were 75 years after, after the fact. Um, I also gained some insight into that um, in reading almost all of them when they went to Berlin that summer, either um, kept a diary or wrote letters home to mom and dad. And um, in the days leading up to the race, the gold medal race in particular, they all pretty much said the same thing. They all basically said, Mom, I really hope we can win this. I, it would really be great to come back to Seattle with a gold medal in my pocket, but most of all, I just don't want to let the other guys down. They, they all said that. Just every single one of them in one way or another said that as they contemplated that race you just saw. Fourth thing that I think was remarkable about them was their extraordinary ability to focus. One of the keys to rowing, this is another sort of fundamental thing about the sport, uh, is um, to keep your eyes basically locked on the back of the person in front of you. It's a sport, as I say, that requires an extraordinary amount of precision. It's technically challenging, and the mental part of it uh, the, uh, the effort to get the oar technically in the right position and in the water and out of the water at the right moment, it, it demands an extraordinary level of attention and focus. And these guys had it uh, to an extraordinary degree. Uh, and particularly in a situation like this where they're rowing, with the crowd noise, as they came into the last couple hundred meters there in Berlin, they came under those viewing stands you saw, and the crowd was just roaring down on them. They couldn't hear Bobby Mock, the coxswain, calling out the count stroke, so he started banging on the side of the boat, hoping they would feel the vibration and know the rhythm at which to row. 
So they were, they were having to maintain this degree of attention and focus under very challenging circumstances. Part of the way they did that is they had a sort of team mantra um, that they would chant when they rode, and it was just very simple, which is mind in boat, mind in boat, mind in boat, to drive, and this is long before people were, most people were doing Zen or anything like that. These, these guys were basically practicing uh, Zen philosophy here, chanting this mantra as they rode. The fifth thing um, is that they were and this takes a little explanation, they were earnest. And what I mean by that is that they took pride in what they were doing. Now, they were proud to represent their country, of course, in, in Germany, anybody would be proud to, you know, to have that honor. But the thing is about these guys is that by the spring of 1936, and this was not true in the whole of the three years that they came together as a crew, but by that spring, um, they were taking pride in how well they rode every time they went out, whether it was just a, a, a practice row, a time trial, or they were going to row against our rivals at Cal. They took enormous pride in the quality of their rowing. They began to approach it as a craft or an art. And that came from um, this really interesting character named George Pocock, who was this British-born boat builder who built these exquisitely beautiful red, western red cedar uh, shells. And it was really, uh, by the mid-1930s, everybody in the country wanted Pocock shells. They were so exquisitely built. He also happened to share, his, his workspace was in the crew house at the University of Washington, although he made shells for schools all across the country. But he, the, the kids at Washington had an advantage because Pocock was there. And Pocock would sometimes go out with them. And he, he would always say the same thing, basically, which is that he would, when I walk away, he would say, when I walk away from a shell, when I'm finished with that shell, I leave a piece of my heart in that boat. When you walk away from a race, I want you to live, to leave a piece of your heart in that race. And as corny sort of as that might sound, these guys took that very seriously. And I think it's part of what elevated them to the, to the level they attained. And then the sixth thing, the sixth sort of quality, again, I'm talking about qualities that I think contributed to their ability to win, but um, I'm going to bring it back also to this notion that these were qualities, I think, that were uh, in some ways representative of the generation um, in which they lived. The sixth thing is the least obvious, but I kind of think it may be the most important quality. And that is that um, every one of them approached rowing with a measure of humility. Now, make no mistake, these were big, tough guys with healthy egos. It's kind of an audacious thing to go out for rowing and to think you're going to win an Olympic gold medal in rowing. It's a tough sport. So they had healthy egos. But over the three years that they came together as a crew, the challenges of rowing past pain, rowing with those frozen hands, rowing with Coach Ulbrichsen, and Coach Ulbrichsen, their coach, was an extremely demanding coach and not a particularly nice guy. Um, rowing with Ulbrichsen, barking at them continuously, um, they learned that there were things that they could do better together than they could do apart. They learned that they needed one another to get through these various kinds of adversities that were constantly coming at them. And that measure of humility bought them a lot. It taught them how to listen to one another and learn from one another and how to adapt in response to that. It taught them to learn to listen to their coaches and to Pocock in particular, and to adapt based on what they heard. It taught them to watch their competitors and learn from them and adapt. It taught them to recognize and frankly acknowledge both their own strengths and their own weaknesses and adapt. And it ultimately tore down the barriers of ego uh, and allowed them to approach one another and uh, build those crucial bonds of trust that I was just talking about that they carried really 
for the rest of their lives. So when I stand back from this story um, and contemplate what it means for me, I think the story of these nine young men who climbed in this boat and learned to pull together so powerfully and so beautifully, I think it's an almost perfect metaphor. First of all, for all kinds of team efforts in all kinds of organizations, uh, any, any organization that, cha that faces challenging circumstances, whether it's in athletics or government or whatever. But ultimately, for me, it's about something much larger than that. I think it's a great metaphor for what their generation did. And I'm talking now about the generation that was my, for me, it was my mother, my father, my aunts, my uncles, the, the generation that Brokaw called the greatest generation. You know, you know, it's always dangerous to generalize about any large group of people and certainly about a whole generation. Um, I, I had one uncle who was a conspicuous ass. Um, it was a generation that in which many people tolerated degrees of racism and sexism that we would find deplorable now. But with that, with those very large caveats, I still think, I think Tom Brokaw had it right. I think they were an extraordinary generation, uh, uh, perhaps the greatest generation, one of the greatest generations of Americans that we've had. Um, you know, they, they suffered mightily in, in the Depression and, and World War II. Deprivation and hardship were nearly universal for that generation. And that deprivation and those hardships taught them humility. They found that there were forces at work in the world that they couldn't overcome as individuals. Beginning in the fall of 1929 with the stock market crash and that unfolded into the Great Depression, they, um, they found that they were suddenly all in the same boat and they had to um, learn to pull together if they were going to survive. So they learned through necessity to persevere, to adapt, to focus, to trust one another, to approach their challenges with a dose of humility. And I think that's how they, um, how they got through the Depression, how they won World War II on not one, but two fronts. An, an incredible thing, just an amazing thing, World War II. Um, and along the way, they taught us to be a great nation by getting things done together, by building great teams, by leaving great legacies. And I, I'd like to um, finish, and then I think we'll have time for, for some Q&A, but um, I'd like to finish this portion of it by uh, just reading a, a, a couple paragraphs from near the end of The Boys in the Boat. I had uh, the opportunity um, while I was writing that section of the, um, the book where the race took place, I wanted to see the regatta grounds that grew now for myself. I like to visit every place that I'm going to write about. So I went to Germany and I went out to Grunau. And while I was there, um, I was able to go up on the balcony of the boathouse from which um, Hitler and the, the rest of the Nazi officials had watched the race. And um, it was kind of an emotional moment for me. And I just want to read a couple of paragraphs. Let's see. Um, okay, I visited the Wassersport Museum in Grunau, where late in the afternoon, Werner Philip, the director, kindly led me up a set of stairs to the balcony of House Vest. I stood there for a long, quiet minute, near where Hitler stood 75 years before, gazing out over the longer sea, seeing it much as he saw it. Down below me, young men were unloading a shell from a truck, singing something softly in German and preparing for an evening row. Out on the water, a single sculler, his blades glinting, worked his way down one of the lanes toward the large finish sign at the end of the course. Closer to me, swallows flew low over the water on silent wings silhouetted against the declining sun touching the water from time to time, dimpling the silver surface. 
standing there watching them, it occurred to me that when Hitler watched Joe and the boys fight their way back from the rear of the field to sweep ahead of Italy and Germany 75 years ago, he saw but did not recognize heralds of his doom. He could not have known that one day hundreds of thousands of boys just like them, boys who shared their essential natures, decent and unassuming, not privileged or favored by anything in particular, just loyal, committed, and perseverant, would return to Germany, dressed in olive drab, hunting him down. They are almost all gone now, the legions of young men who saved the world in the years just before I was born. But that afternoon, standing on the balcony of House West, I was swept with gratitude for their goodness and their grace, their humility and their honor, their simple civility, and all the things they taught us before they flitted across the evening water and finally vanished into the night. Thank you. Thank you for that extraordinary book. <clears throat> you write you. about the boys in the book, but to me, the heart of that shell was Joe <clears throat> and his relationship with his father and uh, the passage that you wrote about Joe uh, being out in the woods with his father and his father leaving him with his uh, new family. Can you just talk about getting that story when you elicited it from Joe yeah. and what it meant to him? Yeah, so um, if you haven't read the book, just very briefly, um, <sighs> Joe, uh, Joe was basically abandoned by his family um, during the Great Depression. His, um, his, his stepmother uh, just didn't care for him. He was a big gangly teenager and she had several children of her own who were hungry and wanted to be fed. And Joe, to her, was just a big, gangly kid living in her house. And um, there came a day um, when, uh, shortly in 1929, I think it was, when Joe, Joe came home from school out in Squim, Washington. They were living in this sort of half-built house out in the woods. And uh, Joe came home from school one day to find that the, the car was loaded and his half-siblings were in the car and all the possessions were tied on the top of the car. and and uh, everybody was climbed in the car, and Joe said, well, where are we going? And his dad pulled him aside and said, well, Joe, we're, we're going to go to Seattle. We can't make it here. But the thing is, son, um, yeah, you're, you're going to have to stay behind. Thula doesn't want you to come with us. And so they drove away, and they left Joe standing there on the porch of this uh, half-built house in the rain. And uh, he was 14. And uh, from that moment forward, basically, he was on his own. He had to make his way in make his way in the world. So that raises the question, uh, which I think is part of what you're getting at, is Joe's relationship with his father. I mean, I can't conceive myself of driving away and leaving my child uh, in the woods or a half-built house. Um, and, yet this, and yet Harry, his father, did. Um, but years later, um, after the Olympics, the the family sort of knitted back together. And uh, Joe never stopped loving his father. He never really carried much anger even towards his father or even his stepmother, who was really sort of the, the source of the difficulty here. Joe, Joe Rance had an amazing ability to forgive people. He, he um, I remember when I, in the last few weeks of his life, um, he, um, he would tear up when he talked about his dad and, and uh, his stepmom. He, he said that he didn't, he didn't want to carry bitterness in his heart, that it would just weigh him down. And he sort of approached his whole life that way. And it was really one of the most remarkable, remarkable things about him. Another question up here? Yeah. My father was a uh, World War II uh, paratrooper. I'm a submarine veteran. Can you talk about uh, how the 36 Olympics prepared this genera the, that generation for us to win the war? Because I don't think a lot of people really understand how important that was. Yeah, you know, I think that's a huge, I'm, the book I'm working on right now uh, 
concerns World War II, concerns uh, for uh, young men who fought in that war. And um, I think all, you know, all those qualities that I mentioned um, really went into shaping that generation and, and not just the men, but the women, you know, the women of that generation, they also were and they had to pitch in and they had to do things they weren't prepared to do and they had to put up with hardships they weren't really prepared to put up with. So I, I think in a sense, the fact that the depression preceded the war, as tragic as both those events were, was fortunate from the American point of view because it really did, the depression itself really taught people how uh, much they needed each other, how much they needed to have each other's backs, how they had to be resourceful, how they had to, um, had to come together and trust one another. And I think that made you know, a lot of difference when they got into uh, the battlefields in either the South Pacific or in Europe. I think uh, when I think of my own uncles uh, and my father with the except for the conspicuous ass one. Um, <laughs> they all had these same sort of qualities I was just talking about. They were uh, civil, they had an element of humility to them, they were um, kind, they were gentle, but they were tough. And I think those, uh, those things were shaped primarily by, by growing up during the Depression. We have time for one more. Hi. Um, is anything known about the other members of the other teams, the Germans or the Italians or the Swiss? Um, not a great deal. I've tried, during, while I was writing the book, I basically couldn't find anything about that. Since I've written the book, I've gotten letters, from, uh, emails from um, some of the descendants of some of the German uh, rowers. Interestingly, I, I believe all the young men that were in the German boat survived the war. Uh, which is kind of improbable because, of course, the Germans had a huge, high mortality. All, all our guys also survived the war, by the way. Um, the only other thing I've learned is the Italian crew, um, they were a bunch of longshoremen from Livorno. They were considerably older than these kids. They were, they were men in their late 20s or early 30s. Then they were big, tough longshoremen from the docks in Livorno. Um, but that's about all I learned. Yes. Can you hear? Okay, there yeah. again. Thank you. Um, as a comment, and this has been very heartfelt by me, but when I listen to the brotherhood, the team that you're talking about, and then Kevin, when you're talking about Arthur Ashe alone, and Hank Aaron alone, and Muhammad Ali alone, and then you talk about the Negro League. And the timing in it is not that much apart, but just the power that could have been, and the power of this can be continued on for everybody. Yeah. Uh, anything else? Hi, thank you. Um, your book um, was a wonderful book. It did talk about rowing, but that was not really what the book was about. Um, and we live in Massachusetts, and between high school and college, our son rowed for nine years. And it is, it is a wonderful team sport. It is grueling, but he remains uh, friends with many of the boys that he rode with. Uh, he's now 36, and they are, uh, they are part of his group of friends. And, um, and anyone here who has not read that book um, really should read it. It was a, a wonderful book yeah. <laughs> on, on, peop on people and uh, relationships and what people go through together. So um, people should really read it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> all right. Thank you all very much.